would be in calling any minute. Yes. And she's she was out there. I can see she was living by faith. She says, "Well, I live by faith all the time." She's mm. just very apt. I know, but what is so wonderful is that that uh, we heard that shortly after we left there, she got a replacement and she went back uh, to England. That in itself proved to us more than anything that how she was only just there for us at the time and Baba somehow or other wanted us to be in that school and have that contact with children then. And that the night that before we were to leave was just the most perfect ending. She had, I don't know exactly what denomination she belonged to, excepting that they had this spontaneous prayer. And uh, in the evenings, uh, she, we would sort of kneel by our chairs, you see, and she would have some prayer, and then we would wish each other good night. And as I say, Kitty and I would go off and do our correcting till about twelve o'clock. So the very last night, she started a prayer, and I heard Miss Davy and Miss Gaby. Just as he uttered the names, there is a a commuter train, a, a, what do you call it, suburban train that goes back and forth there. And we never noticed the train before. But just as she mentioned our names, the train went by. And as her voice went on, the woo 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 the wheels went on, we could hear this voice going on and the sound of the wheels going, but we couldn't hear a word of what was being said. And as the very end of the train went by, the end of the, the prayer, came, and we never did find out what Miss Groom had to say about us. And we decided that was Baba's finishing touch, because if we'd heard anything nice, our little egos would have been rearing its, their heads no end, and we would have been very puffed up, whereas Baba just was having none of that, so we never heard a word of what you're saying. And we know that she was praying to God for us and all our happiness in this, because she became very fond of us. So we know that she must have said a very, very loving prayer about us, and, but we didn't have the opportunity of hearing any of it. And I couldn't afterwards go and tell Mr. Groom, what could you say? We couldn't hear you because of the train. <laughs> but anyway, it was a spontaneous thing. So we had a very fond farewell. The children all came the next day. We, they were allowed to come that Saturday morning and see us off, and the, we came to the school, and they gave us bouquets of flowers and wept some more, and off we went. It was a really unique experience, and I think, uh, well, I might say a miracle of Baba's, because what else could it have been? I mean, on our own, we would have gotten nowhere there in Bombay. And yet, here was this person who just took us in, not knowing a thing about us. On faith. On faith, say. absolutely. Oh, well, I, when in the, the ashram days, when I used to talk with Margaret, Margaret used to say, well, because Baba wants me to be here, that's why I'm here. And Baba says, 100%, I want you here. How can I say to Baba, I want to go? But she said, I don't feel Baba, whereas when I'm out in the world, I feel Baba there. I said, well, Margaret, I, I can't somehow think of being anywhere without Baba. And I just didn't register at all. And then, when we had to go during the new life to Bombay, as I say, it's... Uh, it's then that I realized what Margaret meant. Because if I hadn't felt that Baba was with me all the time, I mean, I couldn't have, I couldn't have stuck Bombay. I mean, if to me, anyway, it was like purgatory. But the very fact that it was a bearable purgatory because I felt that Baba was with me. And there are a few lines, two or three lines, from a dictation which Baba gave at the beginning of the new life, to which uh, I clung throughout that period in uh, Bombay, and the lines are, treat your conditions like a life boy, and stick to it, and it will not let you sink. So I felt all the time that Baba was my life boy, and I knew I couldn't sink. And so that is what pulled me through during that whole period where, where there was the outward separation with Baba. Now to go back to our leaving Bombay for Hyderabad, the date came for us to go and we joined Baba in Hyderabad. And as I mentioned before, Kitty and I made many plans as to what the bus would be, the timings, what food we would take for our lunch, when we would be getting back in the evening and so forth. And still we uh, had no idea of 
what kind of a job we were going to get. And we had not heard at all from this uh, man, which we had been introduced to in Mahamneshwar, who was in uh, Nizam's government. So one day, quite unexpectedly, he appeared at the bungalow where we were living. And uh, he was very contrite and said that it was not possible for him to find us any opening in any of the schools and that he had done his utmost in that respect. But there was one thing very much that he would like, and that would, was to have Baba's darshan. At that time, Baba was not in seclusion. It was still the new life period. But uh, I went in and spoke to Baba, and Baba agreed and said that he would come out and see him. So the man had Baba's darshan, Baba smiled, a few words were exchanged, and he left. And after that, there was never any more mention about getting jobs. Baba never brought it up, and as Baba didn't bring it up, of course we didn't bring it up. And uh, I felt somehow that uh, this contact with this man was something that Baba wanted to have take place. And whenever Baba does anything in a natural way like that, it is in the most uh, uh, natural way. He might have wanted that contact, so we were the instruments to meet the man so that he would come to see Baba, and Baba had that contact with him. I don't know, that's only my way of thinking. Because after Baba once had that contact, and it was, Baba could easily have told us, oh, now you're on your own, you better get out there to Secunderabad and, and see the schools and make that contact. But none, nothing was said whatsoever. The Baba kept us very busy at that time because both uh, Meru and Mani had to be in the hospital. And Gare had to look after them. They both had some operations to undergo. So I was given the job of getting up early in the morning and making breakfast and uh, seeing that Baba's hot water was ready. And Kitty was helping Naja in the kitchen and doing odd jobs. So we were kept pretty busy all the time. And uh, I also used to do all the washing of Baba's clothes and all Baba's things, I mean, bed linen and all that, everything, as Meru used to do. And I want to deviate from that to say that throughout our life in the ashram, people used to say, what do you do all day? I mean, what do you do with Baba? And those that would meet us at uh, birthday time, when Baba would be glowing and sitting on the gadi, and everybody would be sitting around gazing at him. I want to deviate from that to say that throughout our life in the ashram, people used to say, what do you do all day? I mean, what do you do with Baba? And those that would meet us at uh, birthday time, when Baba would be glowing and sitting on the gadi, and everybody would be sitting around gazing at him, and we would try to take a bit of opportunity also to be able to gaze at him. And I remember a woman one day saying to me, oh, how wonderful it is to sit at the feet of the master. And I said, yes, yes, very wonderful. But to myself, woman, you don't know the half of it. <laughs> because we rarely had the opportunity of sitting like that with Baba. Or if Baba called us, the whole group in the ashram, it was for some purpose of some kind. But I say, we had all sorts of odd jobs to do. For instance, I was really a sort of jack of all trades in the ashram. I had to, to do some carpentry work. I used to have to uh, pack and unpack household things. I used to uh, like in Rishikesh, be in charge of seeing of the water that was brought outside was carried inside. And fortunately, the monsoon started coming, so we had to leave there because I think I would have been submerged in the containers of water. I was having to handle so much water. I've even had to do sweeper job for a while. Everything that Bob has given us, he's always given us because... He wanted us to forget the self and be adaptable to his every wish. Now, in this respect, I'll read a few instructions which Father gave us many, many years ago, but which to this day, and for those who follow Baba, are still very apt. 
The following instructions, if carried out wholeheartedly by you, will make you help my work of spiritualizing the world. They are not to be treated like long-established sermons, read, heard, and forgotten. They are not to be understood in the light of philosophical slogans, preached merely for the sake of preaching. They are simple, eternal truths, which I want you all to try your utmost to live. Now, Baba gives us four points. One, amidst all your duties, let the background of all your thoughts be the only thought that God alone is real and all else is illusion. Two, infuse into each other the idea that the ultimate goal of all life is to know God in his true, infinite aspect. Three, think less of yourself and more of others by trying to make others happy even if you have to suffer for it. Four, learn that resignation to my will means not to complain of your lot, that control of mind means not to be upset by difficulties, that loving all as parts of the same whole means not to hurt feelings of anyone. And so we've tried, but we failed so often. Now, we stayed in Hyderabad for quite some months, and then Baba wanted to go back to Merizad. So instead of the four women of Baba's group who had been with them in walking through the new life, uh, Baba decided that they should not walk back with him. So they came back to Merizad by car, and Kitty and I came with them. And Baba at that time then came back to Merizad and immediately went up on the hill and his little cabin was already ready for him up on the hill and uh, so he proceeded right from there so that I don't recollect now that we even saw Baba we may have had a glimpse of him before he went on up the hill this was for the Mananash work and this is for the Mananash work now Baba didn't stay for very long up on the hill he decided it was too windy or whatever work he had done was done in a short time Baba's ways are Baba's ways. And that uh, cabin was brought down from the hill. In the meantime, I had to go for an operation. So I quickly hurried it so that I would get it over with and be back at Merizad by the time Baba proceeded down the hill. Baba came to know about it, and Baba said to, sent word to me that I should not worry in the least. I never had an operation in my life before, but somehow, just because Baba said don't worry, I just didn't. And when the nurse was about to give me the, you know, putting me on the operating table, and when she heard I'd never had an operation, she told me not to be nervous, everything was all right. And I said, but I'm not worrying. And I didn't in the least throughout the whole thing. And uh, even when I came out of the anesthesia, I was murmuring Gujarati and <laughs> telling this young Baba who was near me, don't take my Baba ring off my finger. <laughs> All these things I don't remember, but it showed that from the time I was under the anesthetic till I came out, I mean, I, Baba was on my mind. So this was, uh, by the time I came back, Baba was then making plans for going to the West. And uh, so Baba said, well, Ron, if you're going to the West, you better go beforehand and get further diagnosis from doctors in America. Bob said, no, no, what is this? Ron, it's perfectly all right. And I said, if Bob says, I'm all right, I'm all right. I'm not going to go waste my time with diagnosis. And Bob said, anyway, Ron has to handle my trip, and I've got to have her there. I said, what do you mean by wanting to send her beforehand? I said, Baba, I don't want to go. I mean, it's the last thing I want to do, excepting to be with you. So then I had the, as I say, the good fortune of looking after Baba, handling all the tickets and the passports, getting him on and off the plane, and also the Meru, Mani, I mean, Mera, Mani, Meru, and Gavea, the four that went with us. And Kitty at that time, of course, was also there coming to America. And I remember one of the customs men when we were going through, he said, Ah, oh, so you brought out your friends from India. Isn't that nice? Now give them a good time. <laughs> they were all very obliging because when I wanted to see Baba through, when they had to stamp his passport, I told the official, Don't take me with all the Americans. When my friends come, let me come at the last of the Americans. And then 
because the foreigners were to come next. Even that was agreed to, and everything went very smoothly. Then Elizabeth and Margaret met us, and we went down to Myrtle Beach, and uh, direct from New York. I was there for a short time, and then Baba gave me permission to see my family, whom I hadn't seen after 15 years. And the only stipulation I asked of Baba was, please, Baba, when I go to New York, no restrictions. So Baba was very kind not to give me any restrictions, and so I was able to have an enjoyable time with my family. When I came back to Myrtle Beach, Baba had, had quite a... Uh, few interviews with close Baba people. He'd also had one day of Vadashan with close Baba people. I was there at the time when Baba gave uh, a public Darshan in the barn. And why I remember this so clearly is because Delia de Leon and I had charge of ushering people into Baba and uh, we would sort of keep them waiting and then as we would give them the signal we would usher them in. Now among all the people that had come to see Baba were also the black community, those who had been serving Elizabeth there on the uh, center and their relatives and they'd all become drawn to Baba and naturally they wanted to take Baba's darshan. So their turn came to be ushered into the uh, barn. And what, as I say, impressed me most was that Baba rose from his seat and walked halfway across the barn to greet them, which was an unprecedented thing for Baba to do because Baba, when all the others came for darshan, sat in that big chair of his and everyone came and paid their respects to him and then went out. But when the blacks came, Baba came to meet them. And it seems that it was only just a short time after that when the subject of integration came up and little by little... They began to stand up. Yes. So it, I always feel that sort of Baba was put this, planted the seed at that time when he was giving darshan to them. Now, before we left Myrtle Beach for that fateful trip out across the United States, there were still four people that were very anxious to have Baba's Darshan, and those were four young dancers from Margaret Cross' group. They unfortunately had had to go on tour to Chicago, and they asked, sent telegrams, frantic telegrams, may we come, may we come before you leave and take your Darshan. So Baba had sent word, yes. So they had arranged with some rickety airplane to come from Chicago to be able to get there in time in Myrtle Beach before Baba left. And what is so interesting is that the whole day prior to their arrival, Baba kept talking about them, kept saying, do you think they'll arrive in time? Do you think that their plane will be all right? Do you think that they'll reach here safely? And all the time the subject of them came up in Baba's talk with the Mundley, or rather with us, because by that time the Mundley had left. There were only just the women in Sarosh who were there. When they arrived, we realized why Baba had been, as it were, keeping up a steady sort of talk about them, because they went through the most harrowing experience when they sort of gotten into some thunderstorm with this plane, and really it's only, I'd say, Baba's grace which didn't cause this plane to crash. And they reached there safely. They got and met Baba, and Baba gave them an interview there in his cabin. And uh, Delia was present. And uh, Baba, of course, was still using the board, so I had to read the board for Baba. And Delia was weeping, because they were weeping naturally, that feeling of emotion, and, and at last we have managed to come to Baba. Baba stops his writing on the board, suddenly he looks at Delia and says, what are you weeping about? <laughs> well, I mean, the scene was so emotionally charged. I mean, that was all I could do to not weep also, but I thought, my hands, I have to read the board and what's Baba going to say? So I managed to sort of keep a grip on myself and uh, Baba gave them a very nice interview. Then, as you all know, we started out 
to cross the United States are really ostensibly on our way to uh, Maremont to stay with Agnes Barron. And uh, our stops were at motels and all that. It was uneventful most of the way in the beginning. We went to see some fascinating caves. I think it was down in T Tennessee where they had these stalactites and stalagmites and uh, quite fascinating. And I myself uh, had never seen that part of the United States. And, uh, <clears throat> but what happened is that on the way, uh, we were a bit lax in following Barbara. In one respect, it was not entirely our fault because our car was a much slower, it was a station wagon compared to Elizabeth's car. And on the other hand, I suppose we should have been a little more alert. And we were thoroughly reprimanded by Barbara that we should always keep on the lookout, uh, especially at certain points where we were supposed to meet Elizabeth's car so that we would not miss our directions. And uh, <coughs> so I, of course, had to pipe out at the wrong time and suggest to Barbara that as we all knew where we were going, and uh, if we did miss connections, well, they would just keep on going and we would reach that particular place that night and then everything would be all right. But I got nicely annihilated by Baba for even having made such a suggestion. And all of us in the car, that means Sarish and I were sitting in front and in this row behind in the station wagon was Gaver and, and Delia and Kitty. And Baba said that now you five people must keep alert and all eyes must watch every any crossroad we came or any uh, particular point so that we would not by the slightest uh, mistake miss his car. The Bible was so uh, very sort of emphatic about it that we really felt, oh, I mean, Baba really is serious about this. We better sort of be on the alert. So when we got to the, started going through the town of Prague, I noticed there was a very lovely little sign saying hospital this way, and I said, what a delightful little town in which to have a hospital here, and making comments like that. And then we went on out the town, and out the town there was a sort of incline and quite a hill where you climbed. And when we got almost to the top of Saracen, it seems to be an accident. We saw cars and people all lined up and everything. I thought, gosh, an accident. And Bob said, yes, it's, I mean, uh, Sarosh said, it's Elizabeth's car. Oh, I said, it can't be. He said, what do you mean it can't be? It is. But I looked again, and sure enough, I said, oh, my God. Wait, before Sarosh even uh, stopped the car, I was rushing out. But all my mind was, where's Baba? When I got to the car, where there was poor Elizabeth sort of pinned in on behind the wheel because both her arms were fractured. And she kept saying all the time, take care of the gentleman. So then I looked and I saw that somebody had lifted Baba up on the side of this sort of hill that was there. And there was Mara there and the women were with Mara. Baba pointed the fact that his arm and his leg were broken and he was bleeding profusely from the nose. So I got some kerchiefs and things and sort of mopped it up and then uh, they, by that time, then the ambulance came, and then so many people had to be taken to the hospital that they even brought the hearse because they only had one ambulance in the town. I went with Baba, Gavir with Baba, and there was also Elizabeth in the ambulance, and we took them there. And later on, Dr. Burleson said he'd never seen so much mud and blood because where the accident took place, it had, had, been, had rained the night before which in a way was a fortunate thing because a few days later when I drove by with Sarosh to go and collect the luggage from the uh, car, the whole ground had gone so hard. But at that time it was all muddy. And uh, I wanted, naturally, Burleson to immediately look after Baba, but he said no, he had to look after because Mira had that concussion and that serious gash on her forehead. And uh, so I sort of kind of stayed with Baba till uh, Burleson came and looked after him. 
Baba was conscious all this time? Baba was conscious, and the most fa- the most ex- beautiful miracle is that even Mara, throughout all this concussion, was conscious. And when the uh, specialists came from Oklahoma City to see uh, Mara and take x-rays of her head, I mean, they couldn't believe what they saw, the state of these tiny, tiny cracks and fractures that she had. I mean, anybody else wouldn't have survived on that, from that. And uh, so Baba's leg was set because it was down here at the ankle, that part there. And the arm was uh, also adjusted, but Baba only had to keep that in a sling. He didn't have one that elastic sort of sling. He didn't have to have it in a cast. But then he had had this, um, his nose and the other part of his mouth here were injured. And uh, that's why later on, both accidents, Baba had his nose, so that's why it became sort of flattened down at the tip. I mean, Baba anyway had a sort of biggish nose, but it was all in keeping with his face. But later on it became more bent, and that was due to the accidents. So we were there in Prague. As I say, we practically took over the hospital. There were a few other patients there, but we just, we just, I mean, camped there. And uh, Baba sent for Margaret Trask, and he also sent for Ivy Deuce and Charmin. And by that time, as soon as the accident happened, the Sarah sent the cables off to uh, uh, that, uh, that is, the telegram to uh, Ojai, so that Mundley just barely arrived there and turned around and came back again. So they, about a day or so after we, uh, the accident had happened, they managed to get back. And uh, poor Sarosh, I mean, he felt so much, even though he wasn't driving the car, but being the only one of the men Mundley there, he kept feeling the responsibility of what will the others say to me that this has happened to Baba. But we kept saying, but Sarosh, it's not your fault. I mean, this is something everybody Baba wanted to have happen. And uh, it happened, but you are not responsible for it. But still, he felt so much about it. But he managed to send all the word to India and everywhere, so all the people that should be informed. So that first night, Gavir and Sarish and I stayed with Baba until the Mandali came. Then after that, Baba divided up the sort of watch duty. And then Nilo, Dr. Nilo and I, used to be doing night duty there for, from 7 o'clock in the evening till 7 o'clock in the morning. And we weren't allowed to even nod. So after a while, I filled myself with so many of these pills to keep awake. But by the time the 10 days over, I was just sh- shaking. And of course, having so many pills at night, when I had to go off duty at 7 in the morning, well, I just couldn't go to sleep. I, I used to get about one hour of sleep in the day. And I didn't dare come back in the daytime to the hospital to see how Baba was getting on, because I knew that Baba would be annoyed and say, what are you doing here? You're up at night, and so you're supposed to be resting. So I didn't show my face in the daytime and would come sharply at 7 in the evening and leave in the morning when the others would come, the Monday. So this lasted for about 10 days. Then Baba sent Duncan and me back to Myrtle Beach to prepare for his coming there. And instead of staying at the center, it was decided that we, that is the women and Baba, that is all those who were injured, uh, should be under one roof. So the best would be to be staying at Yupon Dunes, which was Elizabeth's home there in Myrtle Beach. What was Baba's attitude at the time? I mean, was he uh, gesturing or, I mean, he had that sling and so on? Uh, oh, yes, the Baba would naturally always gesture, but I mean, I got so upset one night, you see, naturally, that the, the reaction and all that. I, I think I wept all that first night when I was trying not to let Bobby hear this, that I was that it just like this, you know, and using tissues by the dozen. And then the next morning, Bobby just looked at me and laughed. So I thought, why are you going through all this, you know? I mean, this is nonsense. And I, I felt so badly. <laughs> <laughs> but I mean, the shock, because, I mean, none of us ever sort of imagined it. I mean, accident, yes, but even as money said, well, I mean, uh, Bob is in the car, so nothing can happen. That's the sort of feeling you'd have here with Bob, and nothing can happen. But uh, Bob just meant it to happen, because the, the 
person whose car they, that they, they had the collision with was a young amputee who was driving one of these newfangled cars with the sort of uh, driving equipment for an amputee and evidently he was a bit new at it. And he and the girl that was with him, that car was hardly damaged and they weren't hurt at all. They didn't even have a scratch. And yet Bala had to be hurt like that and the others had to share in it. Even Mera, money got the least, uh, but she had sort of suffered from shock and she got a, a bad jolt on her leg, which sort of, she was limping around about a bit with the knee. Mera was laid up with fractures and a cut on her head also. And then of course Elizabeth had fracture in both arms and uh, she kept complaining of pain and uh, at last they took more x-rays and found that she'd also cracked some ribs. So all the, all the patients were in Dupon Dunes so that the doctor could come and take care of them and see them. And uh, when this happened was in May, a, I think at the beginning, beginning of July or middle of July, we went up to New York. That other whole time we stayed. Bob also went to, uh, what's the name of that hospital that's not far from there? Myrtle Beach, the, where the tobacco, tobacco people, I can't remember now. Baba went there and they uh, took, took x-rays and put a new cast on and everything and found that the leg was healing very well. I mean, the Burleson had made a perfect set on it. <coughs> what was Burleson's reaction to all this? I mean, he must have been he pretty was, overtaken to have He, he like was, that. but then he realized that, well, Baba must be somebody very unusual to have so much devotion from so many people. And gradually he was sort of drawn to Baba. That, uh, not in the sense that Baba lovers are, but somehow he had, he had great respect for Baba. And uh, he, he found himself doing all these things. He just probably didn't know why he was <laughs> doing it. But he gave all of them the, the most... Uh, expert care and he called in outside opinion also from Oklahoma City and everything. But he had a, a beautifully equipped little air conditioned hospital with all the latest equipment and everything. It was really quite perfect. Did Bob ever say anything about Dr. Burleson? About whether he was fortunate or I mean it had to happen here or anything? Well he may have at the time but I myself don't remember because as I say if any of that took place during the time when Bob was in the hospital, then I was only there at night, and the daytime I wasn't there when Bob went to be talking with the others and doing that. But uh, he probably, I mean, considering that Burleson had to look after him, of course, he must have been fortunate. And uh, money still every year, uh, she gets a letter at Christmas time from Burleson's wife. She gives money the news of how they all are there and everything. So I believe in recent years he's had rather a hard time of it and had had some amputation, you know. But still, even even you do something for the master, that doesn't always mean that your life's going to be a bed of roses afterwards. <laughs> so many times people have discovered that after coming to Barbara everything goes wrong, and then and then it's only just because it's their love for Barbara that makes them stick to Barbara, because usually you would. You would expect that, well, I've given my love to Baba, I've given my life to Baba, so now Baba will take care of everything, everything's going to be just roses. But if you have to go through a certain uh, unhappiness or disasters of any kind, I mean, Baba doesn't mitigate these things uh, in the sense of uh, that because you've come to him, this won't happen. It is something you're destined to go through, but because you've had that contact with Baba, there is a softening of the situation that makes it possible for you to see it through, which on your own you probably couldn't have. That's the way I see it. So, as I said, we went up to New York. Well, Baba didn't want to stay in New York City, so through Phyllis we stayed in a bungalow out in Scarsdale that belonged to a Mrs. Ferris. 
And uh, at that time, uh, Shaman Deuce was uh, taking the women for sightseeing. And uh, Kitty and I used to stay at home with Baba if he wanted anything. And there was always one or two of the Mandali that were there on uh, to hand. The Baba had allowed Mayor G and Sarosh and some of the others to be in New York and attend to whatever they wanted to at the time. But Bobby didn't let Kitty and me go out at all. We stayed there completely. Now there I had um, an experience which again jacked me up to how difficult it is to always obey Bob and to remember to obey him at the right time. There was a, a woman cooking for us who had been Elizabeth's cook when Elizabeth had a house in New York. She was part American Indian and part black. And, uh, but her skin was very light in color. And she was an extremely good cook, but rather temperamental. And somehow or other, I, I seem to have rubbed her up the wrong way for some unknown reason. And one day, uh, she, some little thing that I did, she took objection to and started making a big to-do out of it, which completely floored me because, I mean, it was so unexpected and so unwarranted. And because of that, and when I see something that's done like that without justification, I mean, it irks me. So I, of course, was sizzling inside about it. And uh, anyway, I just, in the end, just walked away from the whole situation. It was the only thing to do. But I was still very annoyed about everything that happened. And as usual, everything comes to Baba's ears. I always said, what is this? What happened and why? So... When Baba asked you something like that, you can't gloss over it, you have to tell him. So I told him exactly what had happened. But at the same time, I myself had not calmed down yet about it. This is I absolutely unwarranted, the whole thing. And uh, when I completed my narration of what happened to Baba, Baba spelled out on the board, go and apologize to her. So... When I heard apologize, he said, well, I said, if anybody should be apologizing, it's she. And I heard myself and stopped in midair. I said, I'll go and apologize, Baba. Baba said, no. Now your apology has no meaning whatsoever. If you had gone immediately when I said to you, go and apologize, there would have been some meaning to it. Now your apology like this is meaningless. And then, of course, the expression in Baba's eyes of, Disappointment again, you've, you know, fallen down. That was more severe even than the fact that, you know, that I had not followed through as I should have. But I heard myself. But just too late, in the mid-sentence, I realized what I had done. So I thought, oh, Rana, will you ever learn? <laughs> so that's one incident that happened to me on the journey. Then when we went to England, many incidents seemed to happen where I seemed to somehow or other always be doing the wrong thing. <coughs> Whether it's because my nerves were still sort of a bit on edge in this reaction of what had happened to Baba, that's probably part of it because I know when anybody used to say anything to me, you know, and I just sort of growl instead of, you know, being sweet and pleasant. I can... But the, that has always been a, a characteristic of mine in those early days. When I wanted to hide anything, how I felt, I would always do it by being aggressive so as to cover up. So that's what I was at that time. But somehow or other, I, whatever Bob asked me to do, sometimes I would do it with, I thought was doing the right thing, but somehow or other, it wasn't right. I remember even one time Baba left word that I should wake him at a certain hour, and I woke him up an hour too early. <laughs> and all oh, sorts of idiotic things that happened. And uh, so at last I got frantic. I said to Baba, Baba, we're not very far from America. This is England, and if everything I do is wrong and uh, you're not pleased with anything, then what is the point of my going back to India with you? It's much better if you send me back to America. I wasn't going to leave, Baba, but I was putting it up to Baba that, I mean, what is the point of having somebody around that is such a hopeless and uh, 
a person that every time they do anything you're dissatisfied and so forth. Papa gave me the brush off, you see, sort of, what's this nonsense you're talking about? This only happened on occasions, but still, and in between, of course, we had a beautiful time with Baba because uh, when Baba one time was giving darshan, we went sightseeing, and then Dili arranged because Mare and Money had not seen some different plays in America that we would see them in London. One time we went to a rodeo, another time we went to the ice show, and a uh, number of plays. And what made me happy was that because Baba had to be with the Mandali, that is actually not the Mandali, he went with Nilu and Dr. Duncan. So the women would be sitting separately with Shamin and Delia. And for I still don't know why, but Baba always had me come with him and Nilu and, and Duncan. So each time we went to the plays, and I also had the pleasure of being there with Baba, so that, that made up for all these other little things that seemed to be going wrong all the time. And when we got to Switzerland again, the same thing happened. I happened to, before, was something somebody said that was funny one day, and Baba was at that time having a massage, and uh, I was called in and raked off by Baba for being so light-hearted at the time, and here was Baba suffering, and, uh, and, and I mean, it was, I couldn't help but somebody said this something funny, and just spontaneously, I laughed. So, oh, then I was very upset about Baba, and, 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 oh, and different things happened. Again, I said to Baba, well, Baba, we're only in Switzerland. <laughs> if you want to send me back, can't stand the side of my face, everything I do is wrong. Absolutely, it seems uh, foolish my coming to India. You don't want somebody around that you don't like the sight of. Again, Bobby just brushed me off at this. What's this rubbish you're talking, you see? So, that's how things went on. Now, a very amusing incident occurred while we were there in, uh, in uh, <laughs> Switzerland. There was a young nephew of Irene Billows that she brought, she thought he, Baba would like him to uh, do night duty and it was also take the pressure off Nilu, who was continually doing night duty for Baba during all that period. And uh, so Baba said, yes, he seems a nice, bright young boy. So Gavi used to be looking after Mera and so my job was to be alert in the morning when Baba rang the bell inquire what Baba wanted and then later on see his Mera up yet and then she would come and Baba would wash his face and all. So this particular morning, I mean every morning I got up early, so did Ian, but she had to see about the breakfast and all that. We roomed together just within hearing of Baba's room. This particular morning it was still dark, Baba rang the bell, I was still in bed. Look what happens, what's happened? Baba said, what? Actually, I had no time to dress when Baba rang the bell. You have to come immediately. I was still in my pajamas. Baba said, what's the matter? You're not dressed. You're not up. Look at the clock. Look at the time. I looked at the clock. I said, but Baba, this clock's a whole hour ahead of time. I said, it's only... It's only five o'clock. It isn't six o'clock. So I went back to my room and I brought my watch and I showed it to Bob and I said, look, Bob, there's a whole hour's difference in time. And I said, I can't understand it because I said, every evening before I leave your room, I come and look to see and check that your clock is the same as my watch so that in case your clock went fast or mine went slow or something. I, would, I, so I said, the clocks were identical last night when I, when I looked. So... Nothing more was said very much about it. And uh, some days later, I set the clock right again. Some days later, the same thing happened again. And Bob was very annoyed. He said, what is this? So I said, Bob, there's something very strange. I said, nobody's clock goes an hour fast in the night. And uh, I said, it might go five minutes or ten minutes but not, not an hour. And especially when I check so that there's no, uh, that it wasn't a case of in the daytime it might have gone fast and all that. Then I suddenly started thinking. And I said, that young boy, 
I said he probably with all his heart is is uh, wanting to do for Baba, but probably towards morning he started getting sleepy, and so he probably because he was supposed to go at uh, five o'clock or something like that, and he probably just set the clock an hour ahead and went back home to bed. So I don't know whether Baba ever asked him or not, but that's the only solution that I could figure out as to why, like that, two odd times. We're not consecutive. Two odd times, the clock should suddenly uh, go an hour fast overnight. But uh, I think it tickled Bob, and I don't think he said anything to him. I mean, he was still just a kid at the time. <laughs> and he probably just got too tired sitting there towards early morning. I mean, it gets, if you've been there hours on end, it's, it's pretty difficult for a youngster to stay awake like that. So that was an amusing episode, I thought, in... Uh, while we were there in Switzerland. And then, of course, I told you how uh, I got the seats for Baba to get back after the airstrike in uh, Geneva. So Baba then got back to India, and we came here to Merizad. And while we were in England, Baba had had the cast removed from his leg by a very fine doctor in London. So when Bobby traveled after that, he had just that uh, bandage tied around his leg. And we were some, I suppose, I, it's theories are rather vague in my mind, but we were, I think, some months here in Mirzad, then Baba went down on a tour of Andhra. And then I know later on we went up to Dehradun in the north, and uh, we were there for some months, went up to Masuri, which were up in the mountains during the hot weather, came down again. It was in Dehradun, which Baba uh, procured uh, Shiva. And she was just a young colt, and then had her brought to Mahamleshwar. We stayed in Mahamleshwar for a while. And then uh, after Mahamleshwar, we came to Satara. Satara, we were there. In 1954, I think. I think we got there sooner. And that was the year that Baba had the uh, Savas program in uh, Meribad. So for the weeks that Baba had the Savas program in Meribad, uh, we came from Satara, stayed here at Meribad. Baba used to every day go to Meribad. And at that time he had uh, some 15 or more Westerners. No women, only men. And they occupied all the upstairs on the hill there at Meribad. It was sort of big dormitory was made for them. And uh, the, what is the museum room now is a sitting room for them. And under the shed was their dining room. And a couple of times, Baba had me come there to see them. And that is the first time that anybody besides Mera had seen that ten circles chart after it had been painted. Before that, not even the Baba, Baba's Mandli had seen it. When I finished it, Baba showed it one day to Mera. Then when I had went to see the Westerners, by Baba's order, he had sent me there to see them. Then he told me at the time to show them the Ten Circles chart. And then also, we all from Mera said one day went, when Baba gave the big darshan at Wadia Park. Because at that time, we so had so little opportunity to see Baba giving a darshan. So it was really quite, uh, I mean, this was on such a big scale that we enjoyed seeing it very much. Then, uh, 55, then again we came, we went back to Satara. Then again we came to Merajat, and Baba used to go every day when he had that 1955 darshan. At that time, uh, Francis Brabazon came from uh, Australia to be here at that time, and Don Stevens. And that's when they wrote their two different accounts. Francis afterwards wrote his Stay with God, and uh, Don wrote his Listen to Humanity. Then, 1956, Baba decided to go to the West again, with just taking the Mandali with him. We all stayed in Satara. And it was just about that time before Baba was to go to the West that this seed had been sort of planted in my mind about God, the God Speaks chart. 
So I asked Baba's permission to do it, and Baba said, yes, I could, because this was a good opportunity when Baba wasn't there to be able to uh, work on the chart, because when Baba's there, naturally one's called at all times, and that's one of the reasons why I, unless Baba gave me some particular specific work to do, I didn't draw because I couldn't keep my ideas when I was having to do other things. So this was an opportunity to work on the God Speaks chart. So as I say, Baba gave me permission. So I told Baba, I said, I think I can work out the idea of the evolution and uh, reincarnation, but I really don't know what happens when it starts with the involution and you get on the planes. Baba looked at me and said, oh, well, you just work it out the best you can. So, well, as you've seen from the chart, that was the result of how I worked it out. And when Baba came back, I had all the sketches ready for him, the rough sketches and a huge rough outline of the arrangement of the chart. Then when I wished to work on it, Baba we used to be striding up and down in the veranda for a walk, and it was sort of like his old way of walking, because after the first accident, Baba's ankle healed perfectly, so that it didn't in any way affect his walking. And uh, so Bobby used to walk up and down on this long veranda that we had for exercise. And then one day he started taking interest in what I was doing and the colors that I was putting in. And uh, so each day after that, then he used to stop and watch to see how the progress had taken place. And then when I'd finished all the painting, then Bobby gave me all the wording for the God Speaks chart. Then, uh, of course, that was the accident in the beginning of December, I think it was the 2nd of December, when Baba had the second accident. And that is still a mystery, excepting the very fact that that uh, Baba had to spill, as he said, his blood in America, and he had to spill his blood in India. Because there was no traffic on the road, there was no, no, no obstruction in the road, as far as the story I understand of what happened. And just the, 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 just the wheel went out of control suddenly, and the car went turtle, and uh, Nilu was killed instantly, I believe. And the only uh, person that had just slight scratches was Vishnu. And Vishnu tells the story of how when he went, because Baba had changed seats with Nilu and had been sitting in the back, and he went and sat in front. But Baba had his foot up on the uh, dashboard, and that's how he got that uh, jolt in his hip. And uh, when Vishnu scrambled out of the car to see his Baba all right or what had happened, he said he just saw Baba in a great light with a triumphant expression on Baba's face. He said he was so dazzled for a moment that he just, just stood there. And of course, as you know, Pendu was injured, Erich was injured, and uh, because... What was the scene, though, when Baba came back in the car? He came back to the so, store. So, uh -huh. so what happened? You see, Baba had, had gone for this cricket match. And Baba usually came fairly early, say five or six o'clock in the evening, at the latest. So, it, no, it, say earlier than that, say four or five in the afternoon. So when it got later than that, we all went under the, under the impression that, oh, well, Baba must have been enjoy enjoying his day very much, that he's late today. So nobody, we had no thought of worry about it or anything like that. But suddenly we hear a car in the driveway. But it's not Baba's car, who can it be? So we see this car with a man driving, and all we see is Vishnu and Baba. And Baba again, all the smears of blood on him. We said, oh, this is terrible. Oh, God, what's happening? You see, Vishnu tried to sort of explain. You see, quickly, but well, we have to do something. Let's get Baba into the house and all that. Well, I just didn't have the strength to get on a cycle and go down to the, to the Mandalay's house, which is... We said, oh, this is terrible. Oh, God, what's happening? You see, Vishnu tried to sort of explain. You see, quickly, but well, we have to do something. Let's get Baba into the house and all that. 
Well, I just didn't have the strength to get on a cycle and go down to the to the Manley's house, which was a little distance away, on the and uh, get a hold of Duncan. So money went cycling down to fetch Duncan back up to the house. In the meantime, we managed to get a chair out to the car, and we got Baba seated in the car and managed to get him and bring him and put him on his bed in the room. Then by the time Duncan came, and Duncan arranged to have Baba taken up there to the hospital, and then they, they, he had, uh, had to have his tongue stitched. And uh, then also they tried to take x-rays to see what had happened about the hip. And uh, then afterwards, Baba again was brought back to the house. After a few days, Don said the best thing to do is take Baba down to Pune. So Baba was taken to Pune. He was for a couple of days, I think, in a nursing home. It's all sort of vague in my mind now. It wasn't a great facility at uh, Sattara, was No, it? there wasn't. You see, that's just it. That's why Ba and Don wanted to take him down. So uh, in Pune, he went to this nursing home. And then there was this very fine uh, military orthopedic uh, surgeon which Duncan got in touch with. So Baba didn't like, Baba never likes to be away from home as it were, no matter how serious the thing is. So he, he after a day or so, I think in this nursing home, I was brought to this bungalow which we'd taken there in Pune, which was right near where Mirji was living at the time. And then Baba's leg was put in traction. And that was very uncomfortable and painful for Baba. And he was for oh, a number of months there in, in Pune. Now, in the meantime, uh, Nadja and I were left in uh, Satara to... No first, no, first we came to Pune also. And then Baba said, no, now you, we're not going back to Satara. I mean, nobody wanted to see Satara again after all this having happened. As much as we've loved Satara, we even thought oh, how beautiful it would be to live there because the climate's so equitable. I mean, it's just, just enough rain to make everything nice. The roads are beautiful, it was clean. The bungalow we had was so nice. But still after that accident and seeing Baba coming there in that car, uh, we just couldn't bear the thought of being there. And by the way, what is so interesting also is that on this road, which is not, hasn't got heavy traffic, there, after the accident happened, sort of how to, how to find any conveyance, say, to take Baba back or to uh, get the Mundley to the hospital. Then a car comes along with his lone driver. So, as I say, because uh, Vishnu was the one that was least uh, only just jolted, he was to take Baba in that taxi. And then later on, the others managed to get a truck, and the truck brought them into the hospital. And when that, afterwards, that man in that car disappeared, nobody knows who he was, what his name was, where he came from or anything, but he just came there just in time to take Baba back to Satara. So as I say, Naj and I were sent back to the bungalow to pack up everybody's belongings and take everything back to Merced. So we took, packed everything, and uh, this Mrs. Cooper, whose house we'd rented, her son very kindly offered to drive Naja and me back to Pune when we got all the luggage done. But the yeah, truck came, we saw that the truck was loaded for Merced. And then we went to Pune just to tell Baba that everything had done then we too had to come on here to uh, Merzad to see about the unloading and getting the place ready so that later on when Baba was brought back here, everything would be in order. But it was a harrowing time. I mean, again, Baba having to go through all this pain and this chatter. Because this time it was so much more serious than the uh, American accident in the sense that, I mean, this fractured, I don't know, that head of the, the head of the thing and that, that socket around there, what? that socket around there was fractured or didn't, out of place, so that the socket couldn't be put, the ball of the, of the hip couldn't be put back into the socket again in the, in the sense that it would be uh, as it originally should be. And naturally doctors have wanted to operate on, on Baba, but Baba refused to have any operation. And, uh, 
1970 to 57, I think that's when Harry Kenmore came and uh, gave Baba some treatment and stayed here. That time I had to look after Harry. He was staying in a small bungalow here and I had to see to his bath water and his food and this and that. And we spent our time having altercations because I no longer had an American pronunciation. And oh, that's one of those side issues that took place. Mm -hmm.